Ibu Safitri and Ibu Zubaida, founding managing partners of SIP Law Firm. Ms. Gloria James, head of Singapore Law Society delegation. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very good afternoon to all of you. I would first like to thank SIP Law Firm for kindly inviting us to speak at this appreciation afternoon event. It is our great honour and privilege to address you today. I would like to first begin by extending our heartiest congratulations to Ibu Safitri and Ibu Zubaida for having achieved so much since they founded SIP Law Firm in 2011. In just 11 years, they have grown the firm to one of more than 50 lawyers with office in Jakarta, Jogjakarta and Surabaya. Now at the recent Hukum Online's Top 100 Indonesian Law Firms 2022 Awards, SIP came up first place in the largest litigation practice law firm of the year category and was ranked sixth place amongst top 100 Indonesian law firms. Asia Law 2022 also recently listed SIP as a notable firm for banking and finance and a notable firm for dispute resolution. These and other notable awards that SIP have garnered over the years are truly remarkable and they are concrete testimony of the excellent work and service as perceived by the clients, the domestic and international legal industry. Now, these can only be attributed to the visionary leadership of Ibu Safitri and Ibu Zubaida and, of course, our highly competent and dedicated SIP colleagues. May I also take this opportunity to mention Park Yuda, my dear friend and brother, who was instrumental in today's event. Congratulations are also due to Park Yuda, who is recently listed in Asian legal business Asia Super 50 TMT Lawyers 2022. Now, all this shows that SIPs got talent. Now, SIP Law Firm, and perhaps, yeah, we can have the next slide. SIP Law Firm and Donaldson Birkin Shaw, and my firm can be summarised as Don Burke in short. Now, we forged a strategic partnership in year 2020. As events after 2020 show, and I will elaborate on some of these events shortly, this partnership cannot be more timely. Our countries enjoy close ties in various aspects, which in turn present plentiful opportunities for us to build on and leverage. To begin with, Singapore and Indonesia share close trade and investment ties. In 2021, Indonesia was Singapore's sixth largest trading partner. Bilateral trade amounted to 59.1 billion Singapore dollars. Singapore has also consistently been Indonesia's top source of foreign direct investments since 2014. In 2021, notwithstanding the COVID-19 pandemic which affected many economies, Singapore's investments in Indonesia amounted to 9.4 billion US dollars. Just in the first half of this year, a total of 6.7 billion US dollars in investments has been recorded. Now, in the Singapore Business Federation's National Business Survey 2021 to 2022, conducted on 1,096 businesses across all key industries, 51% of survey respondents who answered currently engaged overseas indicated Indonesia as the country where they are doing business. Singapore Enterprises are amongst the first investors in key projects such as the Kendall Industrial Park and the Nongsa Digital Park. In 2021, the Singapore-Indonesia Bilateral Investment Treaty, the BIT, came into force on 9 of March. While the avoidance of double taxation agreement, the DTA, between both countries came into force on 23rd of July. The BIT established rules on the treatment of investors and investments from both countries. It also grants investors from both countries additional protection on their investments. It was hoped that the BIT could potentially boost two-way investment by between 18 to 22 percent over the next five years. The DTA, on the other hand, provides relief from double taxation in the situation where income is subject to tax in both countries. 
Both countries also have substantive cooperation across a wide range of sectors. Early this year saw the signing of a number of bilateral memorandums of understanding, the MOUs, to further areas of collaboration that support our common interest in the digital economy, sustainability, the green economy, and human capital. For example, in January this year, Bank Indonesia BI and our Monetary Authority of Singapore, MAS, signed an MOU to strengthen bilateral cooperation and deepen ties in areas such as innovation and financial regulation. The MOU reflects both countries' joint interests to promote collaboration in relation to payments innovation and formalise cooperation across an expanded range of central bank and regulatory functions. Now, these functions include monetary policy, financial stability, regulatory and supervisory frameworks, as well as anti-money laundering and countering of financing of terrorism. Now, last month, BIM MAS also signed an MOU to pursue cross-border QR code payments connectivity and promote the use of local currencies in bilateral transactions. This linkage, which is targeted to be launched in the second half of 2023, next year, will allow users to make instant, secure and efficient retail payments by scanning the Quick Response Code Indonesian Standard, the QRIS, and Singapore's NETS QR code displayed by merchants. Now, this payment connectivity will empower individuals and businesses, particularly micro, small and medium enterprises, to conduct their cross-border trade, e-commerce and financial activities more efficiently. It will also support tourism growth as international travel resumes. Now, in January this year, there's also an MOU on bilateral partnership on green and circular economy development. And that was signed between Singapore's Ministry of Sustainability and the Environment and Indonesia's Ministry of National Development Planning. This MOU seeks to promote new opportunities for green growth. Potential areas of collaboration include resource optimization and recycling to address electronic food and packaging waste, as well as potential private sector projects and the sharing of expertise on waste management and green economy development. Now, it is reported in the media that Singapore plans to import around 30% of its electricity from low carbon sources, such as renewable energy plants by year 2035, with Indonesia being among its potential suppliers. In turn, Singapore will be making substantial investments to support green investment and build a logistics port hub in Indonesia. Now, there are other MOUs which I think, given the confines of time, I'm not going to go through every one of them. Now, I've taken some time to outline some of these macro developments over the last two years because they all point to growing opportunities for Indonesian and Singapore businesses to cooperate and invest in the various spaces for mutual benefit. Now, most of you here are probably very familiar with Singapore as a tourist destination. Singapore is only about less than two hours flight from Jakarta. It's a known shopping and food paradise within the Garden City. I do not assume, however, that all of you are familiar with Singapore as a place to do business. Now, at this point, I must qualify that I speak as a disputes lawyer and not a transactional lawyer. My forte is in dispute resolution, not making business deals or advice on corporate moves. What I will share with you, therefore, will be general observations from the perspective of a disputes lawyer who has experience working with international clients. If you have specific questions that I cannot answer later, I'll be sure to link you up with my colleagues who specialize in transactions work. Now, you may have heard some of these accolades about Singapore as a business destination. For example, Singapore is ranked first in the world as the freest economy by the Heritage Foundation's 2022 Index of Economic Freedom, ranked second in the world by the World Bank Group's Doing Business Survey 2020, and ranked third in the world and the most eco competitive economy in Asia Pacific by the International Institute for Management Development's World Competitiveness Ranking 2022. 
Now, these international ranking institutions and reports examine factors such as the country's policy stability and predictability, regulatory efficiency, openness of markets, ease of starting business, and enforcement of contracts. Now, I will suggest that the following factors are what makes Singapore a favourable business destination for international businesses and investors. Now, I think they are on the screen. I will take you through some of these points and also highlight some of the latest developments within each of these factors. Next slide. Now, in the second edition of Chandler Good Government Index, the CGGI, published this year, Singapore was ranked third globally. Now, designed by the Chandler Institute of Governance, this CGGI is the world's most comprehensive index of effective national government. Now, it shows the importance of investing time and energy into enhancing the skills of public servants and the structures they operate within to allow delivery of a better and more sustainable future. In the CGGI, Singapore performs strongest globally in the areas of financial stewardship and attractive marketplace. Now, this demonstrates the Singapore government's strong capabilities in fiscal policy, public financial management and budgeting, as well as highlighting the conducive business and investment environment in the country. Now, the UK government describes Singapore as one of the region's most politically stable countries. The ruling People's Action Party, the PAP, has been dominant since 1959, before Singapore became an independent sovereign republic on 9th of August 1965. Now, the PAP government has been returned to power at every general election since 1959. The PAP currently hosts 83 of the 93 seats in Singapore's single chamber parliament. The largest opposition party, which is the Workers' Party, hosts nine seats. Now, the PAP government's success in taking the nation forward through the COVID-19 pandemic has given people greater confidence in their leadership. With the next general election to be held by year 2024, now, my own view is that the PAP will likely remain in power for the foreseeable future. This also means that national policies can be expected to remain stable, predictable and certain for some time. Meanwhile, leadership renewal at the topmost echelon is a pace in Singapore. The next generation political leaders are collectively known as the 4G in Singapore. On 14th of April this year, 50-year-old Mr. Lawrence Wong was selected as the leader of the PAP's 4G team. On 6 June, he was promoted to Deputy Prime Minister, which cemented his position as Prime Minister Lee Sin Lung's successor. On 29 of June, DPM Wong launched the Forward Singapore Movement as part of his vision for a society that benefits many, not a few. Now, Mr. Wong's rise to top political leadership is not only based on his stellar track record in public service. His steady and cautious handling of Singapore's COVID-19 situation as co-chair of the multi-ministry task force increased his visibility with Singaporeans and convinced many that he is a proven leader who can steer the country out of a crisis. An effective government led by high-quality leadership is only possible when the people is united. There's high trust between the people and their leaders. As our Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong noted in his National Day rally speech this year, Singapore's success in dealing with challenges creatively and resiliently depends on us getting three key master fundamentals right. Number one, a united people. Number two, a high-quality leadership team. And number three, high trust between the people and their leaders. Now, these fundamentals of good governance are key ingredients of Singapore's political and policy stability, which in turn conduce foreign investments over all these years. Next slide. Now, closely associated with effective government is strong rule of law. The rule of law has anchored Singapore's economic prosperity and national development for more than five decades now. It assures businesses of key certainty and the security of investments. It gives confidence that any disputes encountered will be adjudicated efficiently and transparently by honest, competent and impartial judges. 
As stated in the 2022 Index of Economic Freedom, and I quote, Singapore's overall rule of law is undergirded by a high degree of transparency and government accountability, unquote. Property rights are recognised and enforced effectively. Judicial processes are reliable in business-related matters. In particular, in the realm of intellectual property or IP, Singapore has a strong regulatory framework which gives businesses confidence that their IP rights will be protected. Singapore is ranked second in the world and first in the Asia and Oceania region on Property Rights Alliance International Property Rights Index 2022, which measures the strength of a country's property rights regime, including both intellectual and physical property rights. Now, I happen to be one of the regular contributors to the World Justice Project's Rule of Law Index. So this is an annual publication. In the 2021 edition, out of 139 countries and jurisdictions, Singapore ranked third place for order and security, fourth place for regulatory enforcement, and eighth place for civil justice. I shall say a few words about these three factors. Order and security measures how well a society ensures the security of persons and property. Now, it is a precondition for the realisation of the rights and freedoms that the rule of law seeks to advance. In this regard, Singapore is generally a safe and orderly country. Now, we have a relatively low crime rate. Now, regulatory enforcement measures the extent to which regulations are fairly and effectively implemented and enforced. In Singapore, efficiency and effectiveness are the hallmarks of our regulators and law enforcement bodies. There is judicial oversight to hold them to account should they ever act beyond the law. Civil justice measures whether people, ordinary people, can resolve their grievances peacefully and effectively through the civil justice system. In Singapore, our civil justice system is accessible and generally affordable, and it is free of discrimination, corruption, and improper influence by public officials. Court proceedings are generally conducted without unreasonable delays. Court decisions are enforced effectively. Now, foreign investors can be assured of protection under our laws when they do business or invest in Singapore. For disputes arising over business transactions, there are various dispute resolution pathways. For example, claims arising from disputes over sale of goods or provision of services up to the value of 20,000 Singapore dollars can be resolved speedily in the small claims tribunals, usually within one month from the date of filing of the claim. Right, so that's quite speedy. Alternative dispute resolution avenues such as negotiation, mediation and arbitration can be utilised to avoid litigation in court. And litigation, as we know, can be expensive and time-consuming. Mediation in particular has several advantages. It can result in time and cost savings. It preserves confidentiality. It allows parties to have full control over the outcome of the dispute. It is non-adversarial, flexible, and therefore allow parties to also preserve the relationship. Now, if court litigation cannot be avoided, our recently introduced Rules of Court of 2021, which came into effect on 1st April this year, have substantially redefined litigation. Under these rules, the litigation process is effectively judge-led and not left to litigating parties to dictate the pace and agenda. In fact, before parties resort to litigation, and even after litigation has commenced, they have to satisfy the court. The parties have to satisfy the court that they have made best efforts to try to resolve the dispute amicably. Now, for international commercial disputes, parties may avail themselves to the Singapore Convention on Mediation, if applicable, for enforcement of a mediated settlement. Mediation can be conducted under the auspices of the Singapore International Mediation Centre. If there is a choice of arbitration clause in agreements, international arbitration can be conducted under the applicable institutional rules in Singapore, such as under the auspices of the Singapore International Arbitration Centre. Disputing parties involving claims of an international and commercial nature can also choose to litigate before the Singapore International Commercial Court.